Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, today we are pleased to introduce uh, Yanu Chui, our very own, <laughs> uh, who's going to be giving the colloquium today. Uh, Yanu uh, obtained a PhD from uh, University of Michigan. She went on as a postdoc researcher at Harvard and University of Maryland, uh, and then became a senior research fellow at the Perimeter Institute before joining us as a faculty member here at UCR. Uh, Yanu, as most of you know, is a leading expert in the standard model of particle physics, uh, particularly at the interface with cosmology and astrophysics. And her work has been very impactful in various big collaborations such as you know the LHC in June and Lisa. She's got various leadership roles in the community, uh, organizing major conferences and uh, on decision-making panels for funding agencies like the DOE and NSF. And today uh, she's gonna be telling us about the dark side of the universe uh, with a highlight on using gravitational waves. So Yanu, please. Okay, uh, so hello everyone. Uh, thanks John for the introduction. So today uh, I want to tell you about my recent work on probing the dark side of the universe with the new avenues uh, with a highlight on gravitational waves, but I also talk about other approaches. So uh, before everything, I want to acknowledge my collaborators uh, at UCR. Uh, this is in alphabetic order. Uh, Barry and Simin, who are wonderful colleagues. Uh, Chafeng, who's my student, who has been doing excellent work. Uh, Ren Huo, who's a former postdoc at UCR, now faculty member in China. And Martin, who's a Simin student, uh, but we work on the uh, project together. And Michael, uh, who's my first graduate student, uh, he did very well here. And just uh, this September, he moved to uh, uh, his uh, postdoc position at uh, a triumph, a leading national lab in Canada. So he's well on his way to uh, uh, advance to the next stage of his academic career. Okay, so let's start. So first I want to introduce to you uh, the big questions that I am after about our universe. First, there are uh, the deep mysteries about the matching our universe actually comes in three folds. So in our department, uh, first about dark matter, uh, in our department, we have heard uh, a lot of talks on this subject, including Philip's talk last week. So I'm not gonna spend too much time here explaining this, but the main uh, point is that um, dark matter, uh, there's overwhelming evidence for the existence of dark matter, and uh, it certainly demands new physics beyond the standard model. Now there's also this what I call the dark secret of the visible matter or atomic matter. This is about the origin of matter antimatter symmetry or so-called baryogenesis. So this problem is no less significant uh, as the dark matter puzzle. Uh, if we think about that the stars and our own bodies are made of a, a visible matter or the baryons, uh, but so far, we still do not understand this, uh, uh, where the cosmic baryon come from. This is the question about where do we ourselves come from? And embarrassingly, we also uh, do not know the answer. On top of all these two, there's also this very interesting similarity between dark matter and baryon abundance today, which is quite remarkable considering that dark matter and baryon interact quite weakly today. So is this a mere coincidence or maybe more interestingly could suggest a deep connection between the two in the early universe? Now, another uh, big puzzle that I am after is what happened during the first second after the Big Bang? This is also called the primordial dark age. So from our current understanding about our cosmos, the earliest data point we have uh, is at the Big Bang nuclear synthesis time, which is about a second after the Big Bang. Then the CMB light, uh, our best precision tool so far, was emitted long after that. Well, what about the first second that is before the BBN time? We do have a standard cosmology theory 
uh, but many of those uh, assumptions that still need to be tested by experiment, and there are many unknowns. Now, you may wonder, uh, how could this one second uh, short time be of significance considering uh, the, that our universe is billions of years old now? So the key is that uh, if we put aside our human intuition about how short a second is, but instead look at how much the universe has expanded uh, between uh, during this first second, or how much the temperature has evolved, cools down during this first second, you'll see the gap is quite significant. It's up to 20 orders of magnitudes of unknown. Now you may also wonder, but why do we catch about such remote, a remote past history? The key is that this era is very critical it holds the key to big fundamental questions. For instance, uh, the essential dynamics of baryon and uh, uh, generated baryon asymmetry should be established during this one, first one second. And also the seed of cosmic structure today arise uh, from dynamics in this, uh, uh, the very early epoch. So better understanding to, so probing the primordial dark age would be uh, very important for us to better understand and better predict current day observations that may lead to new physics discovery. So in my research, I endeavor to uh, propose and explore new approaches to tackle, to tackle these uh, big puzzles. This include uh, expand the theoretical horizon by promoting new mechanisms. And this is a timely effort because many of the existing solutions, uh, paradigms are being challenged by uh, the experiment data. In addition, I also work on identifying new phenomenology, uh, new experimental search strategies to accelerate discovery. This is also particularly timely uh, as now we're at in the era of rich incoming data from many frontiers. So the research I will tell you today coherently cross three frontiers of high energy physics. Uh, energy frontier related to uh, say the LHC collider physics, uh, intensive frontier in particular, neutrino detectors such as DUNE, Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, and the Cosmic Frontier, uh, which include the CMB large-scale structure, and then also the newcomer uh, gravitational waves. These studies are also highly interdisciplinary. Uh, they lie at the interface of particle physics, cosmology, astrophysics, and uh, gravitational physics. So as mentioned, uh, I will, highlight uh, gravitational waves as a, a probe for new physics in my talk, uh, among other things. This is a particular timely topic. Uh, as we know, the LIGO discovery ushered in a new era of observational astronomy. Meanwhile, there are also unprecedented opportunities for probing new particle physics and early universe cosmology. Gravity waves could be the smoking gun to unravel these long-standing puzzles about uh, dark matter and variants and provide a unique tool for probing the primordial dark age. Because gravity waves is the only messenger that can travel freely throughout space uh, since the Big Bang, thanks to the fact that uh, gravity is the weakest force. So the research related to uh, this uh, gravity, waves, gravity waves is an emerging field that has seen rapid recent growth so as you, I did this uh, chart uh, by taking some statistic, statistics from an uh, archive where we put all the physics preprints at, uh, you can see that up to about 2015, 16-ish, uh, it's rather flat and about 200 paper a year. But then shortly after LIGO discovery, uh, you see over the years, there has been significant steady increase. Uh, in particular, it has drawn a lot of uh, uh, rapidly growing attention in the high energy physics community. Another, uh, so my dedicated efforts in helping to opening this uh, a new frontier uh, started right at the dawn of this uh, transition time around uh, 2016. So another numerics I can uh, show you is that uh, the LISA Cosmology Working Group uh, for which I'm a member at grew from 70 members in 2016 to uh, 350 this year. So in the rest of my talk, I will uh, tell you a few aspects of my work on 
gravity waves as a probe for fundamental physics and early universe. And I'll also uh, briefly mention the, my work on uh, considering hidden dark sector as solution to the matter puzzles. So this part will be brief, but as mentioned, uh, it's just in the interest of time is by no means it's a less important or less exciting. Then I'll briefly tell you about uh, the uh, impact of this research in the research community at large. Then I'll come to a conclusion and I'll look. Okay, so let's start this journey about the gravity waves. What is gravity waves? These are the ripples in layman's uh, language is the ripples in the space time where technically speaking is a propagating fluctuation of gravitational fields. Gravity waves was first proposed by Poincaré in, uh, in, by Poincaré and then predicted, first predicted by Einstein in 1916. But it, the interesting story is that it actually take, uh, took two decades to establish its existence. Uh, if you're interested, you can look at this uh, some historical article which uh, tells this back and forth story. Uh, then the first indirect uh, observation, uh, observational evidence for gravity waves is the energy loss of a, uh, the observation of energy loss of a binary neutron star system that can be explained by the radiation of gravity waves. This leads to a Nobel Prize in the 90s. Then, as we all know, the first direct detection was by LIGO collaboration and leads to another Nobel Prize where our Barry is one of the laureates. So you can see it's quite interesting uh, between Einstein's first prediction to the direct, uh, the direct detection of gravity waves, it took uh, uh, exactly 100 years. Okay, so in this slide though, uh, it's a simple illustration about how the gravity waves uh, are predicted theoretically. So Einstein equation in GR shows us that uh, space-time geometry is related to the matter background. So by varying matter distribution, uh, it would cause a fluctuation in the metric. Uh, we call this uh, H mu nu is a, a perturbation. And it, based on this, we can uh, construct a gravitational field. And by plugging this into this GR, we can find that gravity, gra gravitational field is governed by this uh, wave-like equation. So you can, this should also remind you about the analogy in electromagnetic wave uh, as shown here. So this is a simple story about uh, how the ripples of space-time were predicted. Now the gravity waves have a, has a, a two physical polarizations, plus and cross, it depends on how it deformed the space-time. And the radiation is also, is a, a Cultural radiation, uh, which means that the system has to violate spherical symmetry. Yeah, just some animation here. Now, to detect gravity waves, we need to measure very tiny effect on relative acceleration of test masses. So this is why the LIGO discovery is so remarkable. It's a very hard experiment. And the detectors uh, can, depends on the technology, can cover different frequency range and uh, have different level of sensitivity to the strain parameter, uh, which uh, characterizes the strength of the gravitational field, how it can deform the space-time. Now, if we want to see detectable gravity wave signals, uh, we need to look for sources, uh, uh, which are dramatic violent events in the cosmos. The familiar example that we uh, heard about is the resolvable astrophysical events as observed by LIGO. So these are the transient a chirp or burst events that happened at low redshift or uh, billions of years after the Big Bang. But what I will highlight in this talk is that there are also unresolvable cosmological events that uh, originate from very early, very high energy universe. So in case you're not familiar with this, uh, as our universe uh, expand, the temperature cools down. So uh, when we uh, look forward in time, uh, the temperature of the job, but in the early universe, the temperature is quite high, okay? Now, these events can lead to long-lasting uh, so-called stochastic gravitational wave background. It's in inter direct analogy, well, it's in a close analogy to the CMB uh, for ENM radiation. So it's a, a diffuse background. 
this event that's relevant for uh, the uh, sarcastic background production occurred a tiny, tiny fraction of seconds after the Big Bang. So it's within this uh, the first second. Now, if we look into look at the signal in the uh, time domain, we'll see that it looks sort of just like noise. So even harder to detect. But as I'll explain for you shortly, if we can discover it, it will be highly rewarding. Uh, it can help us unravel longstanding questions uh, in physics. And this stochastic background is a, a channel signal that's actually pursued, that's being actively pursued by LIGO LISA collaboration. And interesting, last year, uh, this uh, pulsar timing experiment that can also measure gravity, gravity wave effect, a uh, nanograph, they observed an excess that is quite, int uh, quite intriguing and uh, it still needs to be confirmed, but uh, uh, stochastic background from cosmological region uh, have been shown to uh, possibly explain this success. Okay, so for an experiment, if you want to characterize sensitivity of an experiment to the stochastic background, we often use this thing called energy density, omega f as a function of frequency that is constructed based on the uh, original, the string uh, parameter. Now, on the other hand, from a theory, we can predict omega GW with this formula, we can calculate it, and then we can see whether your theory could be within reach of an experiment uh, uh, detection capacity. So this is just to give you a first glimpse of how this uh, omega GW as a function of frequency uh, look like and how some of these experiments, uh, what other sensitivity uh, sensitivities are. Okay, so now let's uh, uh, look at some concrete representative examples of cosmological sources for uh, this uh, SG, uh, gravita uh, gravitational wave background. Uh, first, uh, there's inflation, which is a very early era of exponential expansion of the universe that uh, can explain the large scale homogeneity for the so called horizon problem. And it can uh, seed the cosmic structure today. The prediction, prediction of a stochastic background from inflation is quite generic. But in the minimal model, uh, the signal is usually uh, very small. Uh, so we have to wait for the next gen, uh, very futuristic detector to observe them. Now, within better reach of the uh, near future experiments uh, include uh, the source from first order phase transition in the early universe. Uh, which can trigger bubble dynamics that lead to stochastic background uh, gravity wave production. This phase transition could be the electroweak phase transition related to the Higgs. And they could also provide uh, the source of the baryon asymmetry. What I will focus on most uh, focus on this in this talk is on cosmic streams. I will, uh, it's very well motivated as I'll reveal for you more shortly and the signal is potentially strong. So it has been a primary target for both the LIGO and the LISA collaboration. And there's been a continued uh, publication of the official reports. So if we can discover uh, some of these uh, cosmological sources and their gravity wave signals, it's really exciting. That this is like listen to the echoes from the Big Bang era through the tools of gravity waves and solve big puzzles. Okay, so now let's start to look at some uh, uh, this uh, cosmic strings as an example. So strings, these strings are one dimensional topological defects on cosmological scales. They can originate from super string theory or non-trivial solution of field theory with certain symmetry breaking pattern. For instance, a U1 symmetry breaking that could be a gauge U1 or a global U1. Uh, We'll talk about global case later, but uh, we'll first talk about this uh, gauge case. And we can, uh, for instance, look at the abelian Higgs model, where this complex scalar live in this uh, Maxington head potential. Now, the familiar vacuum solution for this uh, model is that the phi takes the same web everywhere. But Nielsen and Olsen uh, found that there's a non trivial string like solution where the phase of this phi uh, position is position dependent. Well, it's a, the web is zero at the origin. So this kind of configuration uh, 
reveal itself as a tube of false vacuum, uh, which could be closed loop for open long string. And the tension of this string is a uh, uh, proportional to uh, the symmetry breaking uh, web square. Okay, so in case some of you think uh, this uh, cosmic string or the well motivated, maybe a too exotic uh, object to consider, I want to tell you that uh, there's actually close analogy uh, with a very similar theoretical uh, region uh, in the condensed matter. That is a vortex in the type 2 superconductor, which has been already observed. So the cosmic strings is certainly not a wild idea uh, and it's uh, uh, worth looking for. Okay. So how does a string uh, come, cosmic string uh, come about in the early universe? They are formed uh, through the Kipple mechanism, uh, essentially as the universe cools down, it undergoes a phase transition at a critical temperature. And after, but at this point, the phase of this uh, Higgs-like scalar cannot be correlated on scales beyond the horizon size, which is finite. Therefore, the string necessarily formed at the boundary of the causally disconnected domains. Now, if we look into the sky, this, we would expect to see a few horizon sized long strings along with many string loops uh, that are formed by long string intersection. So just to entertain you, this is a, a simulation video uh, uh, by the cosmology uh, group at Cambridge, in Cambridge University to show the string network evolution. Now, if the strings exist, uh, there are many ways to observe them. It's a quite rich signals. In this talk, uh, I will, well, uh, here I will just uh, uh, highlight on this uh, uh, one of the effects on structure formation uh, that was proposed in my paper with Simi and Martin, uh, where we show that this uh, very interesting cosmic filament structure can originate from cosmic strings. And among other things, uh, there's this gravitational wave is the universal uh, signal that I will uh, focus on. Now, gravity waves were emitted uh, from string loops as it oscillates. And uh, if this event, this uh, uh, gravity wave burst event happens at the low redshift and resolvable, they would uh, uh, show up as transient uh, signal. But the on the other hand, the accumulation of unresolved uh, bursts from high redshift will lead to a stochastic background. Now, the computation of the gravity wave signal from a, a string network is a complex process. I'm not going to bore you with the, the technical details here. Um, but I want to highlight uh, two points. One is that the emission from the string network uh, is continuous throughout a long epoch of history. Because of this, it, this source can populate gravity waves over a rather wide frequency range and enables this cosmic archaeology technique that I will introduce uh, to you shortly. Another thing is that to calculate this uh, energy uh, gravity wave signal, we need to integrate over the emission time and also some over oscillation modes. So uh, as I said, you do not need to worry about the details. I will make sure I always emphasize the take home message uh, so uh, everyone can follow. So the take home message for this part I want to, to take note on is uh, a, a point from this, uh, uh, the final result after we put together everything. The key things to keep in mind is that Omega GW, the gravity wave uh, uh, spectrum, is de you can is determined or one of the key factor is this expansion parameter a uh, which characterizes the size of the universe as a function of t. So, as we'll uh, show you shortly, the a a as a function of t is directly related to the Hubble expansion rate, uh, its evolution or the evolution of cosmic history. So this information is encoded in the gravity wave spectrum. Uh, this is very important. So in case you're not familiar with, uh, the Hubble expansion rate is uh, defined as a dot over a. 
by applying Einstein equation in our expanding universe geometry, we can find this relation between Hubble and the total energy density of the background universe. Now, there are two important effects uh, that the background energy can uh, affect Hubble, which will be relevant to uh, our later discussion. First, uh, the equation of state of the dominating energy composition would affect the relation between Hubble and uh, the expansion parameter. For instance, uh, this, there's a parallel of minus three, minus four for matter and the radiation domination, respectively. And another effect is if we have relativistic host species, they would contribute to the Hubble uh, in terms of this uh, uh, effective degrees of freedom, uh, relativistic degrees of freedom parameter, GSR as a prefactor. Now, the first uh, obvious example we want to test is to uh, specify the age as in the center cosmology uh, based on our assumptions. So here's a quick review of the uh, center cosmology uh, where this uh, uh, the yellow line is the horizon size as a function of the expansion parameter. So you see in our standard uh, cosmology picture by the inflation, and then there's a long epoch radiation and then matter domination. These kinks, as you see here, uh, really it originate from uh, what I just told you here because of the change of equation state. So it changed this uh, parallel here. But I also uh, want to remind you that uh, although center cosmology is cool, but if in the first two, uh, the first second is full of mystery. Uh, we do not know uh, what happened there yet. Okay, so first in our work, we first uh, calculate the uh, gravity wave spectrum with the center cosmology. Uh, as I've shown you, you plug in the H as a function of T to this uh, formula we derived, then you can find the spectrum. So the spectrum is shown in this solid black line. So a key feature is that towards a higher frequency, there's a long, almost flat plateau. Well, uh, so if you have any deviation from the standard picture, we can see it easily. Another key thing, we, a very important thing we uh, found in this paper is that gravity wave with a given frequency was mainly contributed by loops form at a certain time or certain temperature. So the cool thing here is that if we look by looking back, uh, by looking towards a high frequency part of the gravity wave spectrum, we're actually looking back in time to uh, re, uh, look at the information from the early universe. This is very important because uh, this finding suggests a unique way to shed light on the primordial dark age uh, using gravitational waves. In our work, we quantify this FT correspondence in detail as shown here. Now, let me just elaborate this FT uh, relation uh, a little bit. Uh, so it is very important, this correspondence allow us to uh, uh, do this, what we branded as a cosmic archeology. span the point again is because as we have seen the Hubble or the cosmic history's evolution determines the gravitational wave spectrum. And in turn, in observation, if we observe a certain pattern of the gravity wave spectrum, we'd be able to infer uh, the information about the cosmic evolution, the Hubble expansion parameter. We examine the application of this method in practice. So, as we know, the gravity wave experimental uh, coverage now is up to a frequency of 100 hertz. This, uh, if we consider the FT relation, means that uh, using this method, uh, we can probe the cosmic history from BBN time all the way back to uh, the temperature of 10 to the 4 GeV. Well, BBN is at a mega EV scale. So it's, this is well above the electric scale uh, phase transition. So in the last slide, uh, what I showed you was, uh, uh, well, the two slides before was the uh, result uh, when we plug in the center cosmology. But as I emphasized uh, many times in this talk, we do not actually know the history before BBM the first second. On the other hand, uh, the 
departure from this uh, standard paradigm are uh, actually very well motivated. Uh, one example is that there could be non-standard equation of state or new phases or alternative cosmic history. This include, uh, for one, the potential, uh, the possible early matter domination, which can arise from long-lived particles or permutable black holes, and it has potential relation to supersymmetry, baryogenesis, dark matter physics. Another possible new phase is a kinetion. Uh, this is an era where a energy component is dominated by uh, kinetic energy and is redshift faster than radiation. This can originate from some models for inflation, dark energy, or axions. Now, the presence of any of these uh, uh, new phases would mark a dramatic deviation from our assumption that there's a prolonged epoch of radiation domination. And this kind of departure or deviation actually really matters because recent work has shown that uh, they may have an impact on the late universe, such as the dark matter halo structure and dark matter indirect detection signal. Another way that possibility that uh, uh, the standard cosmology paradigm uh, may see a, a deviation is the possibility that uh, there may be new particle species uh, which are very gen generically predicted in BSM particle physics. And there may be even hundreds of them. For instance, as motivated from uh, dark sector uh, solutions to hierarchy, electric hierarchy problem. Uh, so in general, these new particles could be well beyond the reach of existing means uh, because they're too heavy uh, or too weakly interacting for LHC or CMB. But the good news is that typically they would be in form of radiation in the early universe. And that's contribute to this G star variable that I told you earlier, uh, the uh, number of relativistic degrees of freedom. And then in turn, it, as I shown you, it can uh, affect the Hubble expansion rate uh, through its gravitational effect. Now, the next thing we did in our paper is to look at how how would the non-standard cosmology change the spectrum from the strings? Uh, what's the imprint? So as you can see here, the solid line against a standard uh, cosmology prediction. Then we take the benchmark uh, points, uh, assuming that there's a transition from radiation domination to other phases at a certain temperatures. So the rising line you see here uh, is a prediction if there's an early connection dominant era, where the uh, falling line uh, from early matter domination. You see the departure uh, from the standard case is quite dramatic. And the transition point in the frequency spectrum are exactly what we predicted uh, based on the FT correspondence that I introduced earlier. So again, it's a cool way to look back in time uh, with a gravity wave spectrum. Now in our work, uh, we also look into how, uh, what's the effect if we have new particle species. Uh, for instance, we assume that there may be new particles arising at a weak scale, helping to solve the hierarchy problem. And consequently, uh, the gravity wave signal would see uh, a falling uh, plateau at high frequency after a certain frequency point. Now, the last example about the uh, uh, cosmic archeology span I want to tell you about is this uh, uh, paper uh, uh, published on PRL on gravity wave bursts as a harbinger of cosmic strings diluted by inflation. So recall that early in this talk, uh, I mentioned that inflation is a very well motivated uh, early era of exponential expansion of the universe, which naturally leads to exponential dilution of any pre-existing content. Now, in case you wonder, uh, the universe today was replenished after uh, this extreme emptiness through the so-called reheating process. So anyway, the standard law uh, that we know for long is that inflation would bury all the relics before it. But in our work, 
uh, we found a counter example uh, that's sort of an exception to the standard law. We found that the cosmic strings can regrow after inflation and leave distinct gravity wave signals that allow us to even probe the pre-inflation era. So how is this possible? Uh, I don't want to go into details, but the simple math, uh, the simple reason is that the after inflation, the correlation length of the string grows slower than the growth rate of the horizon size. So slowly the string can come back to horizon uh, after inflation and rebuild its energy density and uh, produce signals. So in our work, we work out uh, this uh, distinct gravity wave signals in different channels uh, from this diluted then regrow network of strings. We found that in terms of stochastic background signal, it's suppressed at the higher frequency uh, relative to the standard prediction, the, the standard cosmology prediction. And the strong constraints on uh, gravity waves based on uh, LIGO or pulsar timing can actually be alleviated uh, in this scenario. Now, the highlight in this work is that gravity wave bursts, which are the transient uh, resolvable events uh, due to the strings, they are usually the subleading signal uh, relative to stochastic background uh, when we look at standard picture. But in this scenario, they can be the leading discovery channel. So this uh, show our result. All right. So that's about the cosmic archaeology with gravity waves uh, to probe the primordial dark age. Now I want to switch gear uh, to tell you about uh, uh, how we can apply gravity waves to probe axion-like dark matter candidates. So this work is done uh, with a chaffon. Uh, so axion-like dark matter or ALP dark matter, uh, ultralight pseudo goldstone boson from a global UN symmetry breaking. And it's a leading alternative to the wind dark matter paradigm. It's originally, originally motivated as a QCD axion uh, solving strong CP problem. But generic uh, ALP are also well motivated. There's been a lot of recent interest on this subject. But among all these efforts, a relatively underdeveloped aspect of ALP studies is the implication of ALP topological defects, including cosmic strings, domain walls, which are generically indispensable com companion of the ALP particle that most people focus on. The reason is that upon the breaking of a global UN symmetry, the axion of goldstone would arise as the angular uh, light angular excitation mode, while the global cosmic string can form uh, with the same uh, principle that we mentioned for a Bayesian Higgs model, because uh, the phases cannot correlate on, uh, uh, beyond the horizon scale. Then, if there's a discrete symmetry breaking, uh, domain wall can also form. So the cosmic strings and domain wall from axion models can have significant impact on dark axion physics and the detection methods. There have been ra rapidly increasing interest uh, in very recent years. So in our work with Chafeng, our focus is to see, uh, to investigate the gravity wave signal from global axion cosmic strings. This subject is overlooked, but could be a discovery channel. The reason it is overlooked is because by naive estimate, the signal is too small. Well, the early literature, uh, some of them even suggest that the signal is not detectable, it's too small. So this global string scenario is very different from the gauge or the number go to string case that most people studied and I uh, explained to you earlier. For global string, because you also have this very light goldstone, uh, nearly, ma nearly massless goldstone modes, uh, their emission, is often, uh, often dominates over the gravity wave radiation. Also, uh, relative to the global, uh, local string, the global string string tension, this mu uh, parameter has this log divergent uh, that is time dependent. So why are we interested in this uh, uh, small signal of gravity wave, uh, 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 gravity waves from global strings? Although we know, it, even though we know it's a small uh, a subleading channel. The, our key motivation is the, is the realization that uh, uh, the rare decay mode could be the discovery mode, as we have learned from, for instance, the Higgs discovery. 
And also you can say we have copied a lot more axions, bosons produced, but the detection techniques of those particles uh, depend very model dependent, depend on how it interacts with the standard model, which uh, has a large uncertainty. On the other hand, gravity wave signal uh, is a universal uh, signal. We know how it works and it gets more promising as the gravity wave detector sensitivity improve in the coming years. So in our work, uh, using a semi-analytical approach, we calculated the uh, stochastic uh, gravitational wave background from global strings. The most uh, important result we found is that the signal is detectable with upcoming gravity wave experiments, unlike some of the earlier literature suggestion. And our finding was uh, inspired uh, many uh, follow-up works and uh, including some recent simulation findings that uh, support uh, our result. We also found that the frequency temperature correspondence in the global string case is very different from the gauge case. Um, and uh, it allow us to probe uh, even higher temperature up to 10 to the 8 GeV uh, much earlier uh, than uh, even the gauge string case. Now in this more recent work, uh, Chapman and I investigated the, uh, the effect of non-center cosmology and new particle species on the global string uh, gravity wave spectrum. Uh, it's shown here. All right. So hopefully uh, by now you have seen many uh, interesting examples how we can use uh, stochastic gravitational wave background to probe exciting new physics. Uh, but here's a caveat to all this ex uh, excitement uh, with respect to cosmological stochastic background. The catch is that the stochastic gravitational wave background can also originate from astrophysics. For instance, uh, from unresolved binary mergers that happens at high redshift or when the signal is very weak. So this astral source of uh, gravity wave background is of course inter very interesting on their own, but in terms of the, uh, the particle physics or uh, the high energy physics uh, 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 that we want to probe with the cosmological signal, they would uh, sort of could be an overwhelming factor or uh, can cause confusion uh, with the, uh, this the cosmological source. But there's no reason to get uh, too pessimistic. First, if we are lucky, the cosmological signal could be large and reveal itself as obvious success over the astral background. And in general, uh, this is a signal versus background problem. And we do have, it's not so insurmountable. We do have successful histories to draw inspiration from uh, such as from the studies of CMB and LHC. Furthermore, uh, as uh, hopefully you have realized so far that if we can discover this uh, cosmological signal, the potential rewards is uh, huge. We can, uh, it can shed light on many of the big questions. So it's worth the effort uh, in, uh, for this reason. The possible solutions to this uh, 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 concern is a, uh, important uh, currently developing area of research. Uh, among the uh, several possibilities that people have proposed in this talk, I will uh, focus on uh, the solution of, by, using, by utilizing information in the frequency domain. The key uh, point here is that the astral and the cosmo stochastic gravitational background, uh, although they are similar in the time domain, they generally have very different shapes in the frequency domain, so could, which could serve as a discriminator. Now I want to, uh, speaking of this uh, of frequency coverage, I want to show you the landscape of gravity wave experiments in terms of frequency band. So as you see here, uh, today we have LIGO. We also have a, a pulsar time experiment uh, covering the frequency over here. Then uh, in between, uh, LISA will be launched uh, in the coming decade. And the CMB, which is uh, not shown here, can cover uh, um, uh, a range in a uh, much lower frequency range. But you notice that there are some notable gaps. The most important, uh, the most studied one is so-called mid-band range uh, that lies between LIGO and LISA. 
the many proposals for this. So uh, I will focus on uh, the impact of this mid-band in my talk. Okay, to just give you an intuitive idea about this, uh, the existence of these mid-band experiment proposals, there are later laser interferometer-based experiments such as Disoigo, Tiango. Uh, and there's also atomic interferometer-based experiments uh, has been proposed to cover this range. Now, this paper with Barry and Simin, our goal is to conduct a dedicated study on how a future mid-band experiment can complement LISA and LIGO uh, for improving the sensitivity to the cosmological background and separate it from the astral source. In our work, we did explicit modeling of both the astral and the cosmological sources. And uh, in terms of bigger picture, uh, we hope to help boost the science case uh, for mid-band experiments uh, from a high energy cosmology motivation. Uh, for most of the gravity wave experiments so far, uh, the, uh, the main driver is uh, uh, astrophysical consideration. So we think this could be a good company, uh, a good complement. So our key results include, uh, first, we propose a combined parallel sensitivity curve <coughs> that shows a generic improvement of inclusive stochastic background against noise. So it's a very cool, but I don't have time to show you in detail about this, but I will show you in, lit uh, in a little bit more detail about uh, our finding that there indeed can be a significant improvement in separating COSMO from astral sources with the help of the mid-band experiment. So here are some plots showing our re the results from our likelihood analysis uh, for uh, uh, cosmological, uh, considering different cosmological sources. So first, a cosmic string example. So looking at these plots, <clears throat> uh, you don't need to worry about the technical detail how we uh, got this, uh, but the main thing is that these 2D plots uh, shows how well uh, the certain experiments can be sensitive, can constrain or uh, pin down uh, uh, the model parameters. The red contours, the red shaded regions are the one and two sigma contours uh, with LISA and LIGO data alone, while the blue contours are with the help of mid-band experiment. So before I tell you anything, you just look at these plots you'll notice that visually it's obvious that for most of these uh, panels here, the blue region is much smaller than the red region, which means that the mid-band can really help us localize and uh, constrain the parameters better. So indeed, uh, we found that there can be up to orders of magnitude improvement in the sensitivity to this uh, string tension uh, in terms of constraints. And in terms of discovery uh, uh, potential, uh, with a, a mid-band, we can also uh, help uh, break degeneracy and pin down the cosmological uh, model parameters a lot better than with the, without the mid-band. Now, this is uh, the example from a uh, gravity wave. Uh, the cosmological source is a, a early, uh, early time phase transition. So again, you can just visually, you can see that the blue contours are much more shrinked relative to the, the red uh, contours. So we see again that here, the mid band can, uh, has a great advantage to expand our coverage for the phase transition temperature. And also this, uh, the red panel here, maybe is the most uh, demonstrating plot here. You can see that with the, uh, Lisa and LIGO alone, this uh, red region is all over the place. Well, with the mid-band, uh, the model parameter is uh, narrowed down uh, to uh, a quite, quite much, uh, a lot better. Uh, so indeed, uh, the model parameters of the cosmological signals much better localized uh, with the mid-band data uh, because uh, it allows us to characterize the shape information of the spectrum, uh, which is very important to determine the model parameters. Okay, so that's about the story of uh, gravity waves as a probe of new physics. So now in the last few slides, I want to uh, briefly tell you about my work on uh, related to uh, hidden dark matter sector and biogenesis. 
Now, as many of you heard about, this WIM dark matter is an attractive dark matter candidate, but it has been increasingly challenged by data. Therefore, uh, dark matter beyond the WIM paradigm has been a hot topic. This including the possibility, include the possibility of axion dark matter, primordial black hole, and also uh, a very appealing class model is dark sector, which means that the dark matter physics is now minimal, uh, composed of multiple dark states or, and even, or even dark forces. Uh, this is a, considering how complex our standard model is, as you see here, uh, this is a very natural and generic possibility. It's a very active area of research. It's a key synergy among uh, the UCR, the faculty in our department in high energy physics uh, theory and astronomy. Uh, for instance, this self-interacting dark matter is a, a interesting class of the dark spectrum models, and uh, uh, Haibo is an expert in this topic. So my contribution in this direction is through systematic classification of uh, thermal dark sector possibilities. Uh, essentially, I look at this diagram uh, of a new realization of wind miracle, where instead of dark matter annihilate to a standard model final states, uh, it's, uh, it goes to uh, interact with the dark state. And by classifying the possibility of X, uh, I found, we found a, a new avenues for dark matter discovery. So uh, one of the uh, signal I want to highlight, phenomena I want to highlight is this uh, boost dark matter idea uh, that can uh, provide a very new uh, type of signal that can be observed in neutrino experiments. This idea was first proposed in my earlier work, uh, now has a, uh, is highly cited, and is well known in the major uh, neutrino experimental collaborations. The official analysis and ongoing study is done uh, by the SuperK collaboration, it's published, uh, and it's also highlighted in the Dune TDR. Uh, we have a chapter on that, and I'm a co-author on this Dune TDR as a, uh, a member. Recently, with my collaborators, at, uh, at, uh, uh, including the uh, team leaders at Stanford Slack, uh, we published a paper on boost dark matter search with hydronic interactions. Another interesting channel is the dark radiation. Uh, so these are signals that can be observed with dark matter direct detection experiments, CMB, a large scale structure data. So I published a series of work in this topic, uh, including one with a former UCR postdoc, uh, Ran Huo. Now this last slide about uh, uh, research topic is on biogenesis. Early on, I proposed this uh, uh, mechanism of a uh, Biogenesis from metastable WIMP decay, or in short, WIMP biogenesis, which is a new mechanism uh, that can simultaneously address the barium puzzle, uh, the barium asymmetry, and this uh, barium dark matter coincidence. In terms of phenomenology, a very general, generic, and uh, exciting prediction from this type of model, it, it gives a prospect of reproducing early universe biogenesis process in the current day collider experiments uh, in, in, term, uh, in this channel, uh, search channel called long lead particle or displaced vertex. So the figure here, the left panel shows how the event topology will look like in the collider experiment. And in comparison, you can see that uh, 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 there's the state, if it's a stable WIMP, then we look for it as a, uh, in terms of missing energy at LHC. So I think it's a, a quite interesting uh, analogy and equally exciting. So after our work is out, uh, it uh, quickly drawn the interest, uh, drew the interest from Atlas uh, collaboration. And uh, uh, this biogenesis model has been adopted by the Atlas long lead particle working group as one of the few benchmark that they include uh, and actually uh, simulate uh, in detail uh, in their official report that was published in 2019. So while they were doing the analysis, I played an advisory role for their study, and I look forward to helping them more uh, for the, uh, with the future data. So at, uh, here uh, with my student, Michael, I also further developed the uh, model building aspect of wind genesis, uh, this uh, idea. Uh, particularly, we proposed uh, so-called wind cogenesis, 
where we can, in the same decay chain as shown here, we can simultaneously produce asymmetric dark matter and baryon asymmetry. And there's a rich signal that we predicted, uh, which can be tested. In addition, uh, along with Michael and other collaborators, I also look at uh, new ways to probe other compelling biogenesis models uh, beyond the one that I, that I proposed myself. Um, this include, for instance, testing direct leptogenesis. Uh, this is the mechanism that can also relate to the original neutrino mass. So testing this lab, direct leptogenesis by combining CMB observable and terrestrial neutrino measurements. Okay, so that's about the, uh, the research projects and the result I want to tell you in this talk. So in this slide, I want to uh, briefly uh, tell you about uh, how this research I have uh, told you about uh, what's their impact in the uh, research community at large and how I represent UCR in some of the uh, big collaborations and major events. So as my work on boost dark matter and gravity waves were uh, well recognized by the June and uh, Lisa collaboration, I was invited to join June as institutional board member uh, and contributed to the June TDR. I also a social member of Lisa consortium uh, and I particip actively participate in uh, Lisa science book writing uh, along with Cha Feng. Uh, yeah, so as I joined these collaborations, I also officially brought in the members in my research group at UCR. Uh, for Lisa, also brought in Simin and some of his uh, uh, group members. In addition, as mentioned, I'm also a theoretical advisor for the Atlas long lived Particle Working Group Analysis. Uh, furthermore, uh, with the, the goal of uh, help uh, advance the uh, scientific research on these uh, uh, big questions in the uh, bigger community, I've been actually engaged in proposing and organizing a major uh, conferences and meetings. Uh, for instance, uh, we, I uh, co-proposed a long-term program uh, at the Cup Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara, KITP, um, from inflation to the hot big bang. And uh, our proposal was uh, approved and uh, I was appointed as the lead organizer. And I also co-convened the associate conference uh, last year. So I want to mention that uh, luckily our conference, our uh, program was I think the last one that was able to uh, finish fully in person before the COVID situation escalated. Then I also uh, co-proposed a workshop on probing new physics with gravity, wave, with gravity waves at uh, uh, MITP, uh, also a renowned institute in Germany. Uh, it should have happened now, uh, but because of COVID, it was postponed to next year. Now, uh, I was also honored to uh, be invited as a, to serve as a member of the uh, American Physical Society Division of Particle Physics uh, Program Committee. Uh, in charge of uh, uh, organizing uh, events related to dark matter. Uh, in this uh, past April meeting, the APS, I was the organizer and chair of this uh, joint session on new frontiers in dark matter research. So other my professional contributions include uh, being invited to serve as panelist or reviewer for uh, multiple programs at uh, Department of Energy, National Science Foundation, and also major funding agencies in Europe. I was also appointed as the editor for the theory a summary session and the journal corresponding author for this uh, important community uh, report, the white paper on new opportunities at the next generation neutrino experiments, uh, which is organized uh, by the chairs of the Dune BSM working group. Okay, so now let me come to conclusions. Um, as in this talk, I've shown you there are great mysteries that remain about our universe, but we also have a very exciting time ahead uh, where we expect to have many great experiments offering great opportunities for discovery. My work is well connected uh, to uh, the big experiments across the different frontiers, uh, including the LHC, uh, uh, neutrino next generation neutrino experiments such as DOOM, uh, CMB stage four, uh, LIGO and LISA. So we'll see a lot of, expect to see a major upgrade or launching 
on many of these experiments. So it's a very exciting. So my contribution uh, to this endeavor to unlocking these big questions as I'm uh, discussing this talk include proposing uh, new theoretical mechanisms, um, proposing new experiment, experimental search strategies, uh, which have already uh, been ha uh, having an impact at uh, experiments such as Dune LHC. And I'm also part of the gravity wave for BSM initiative after LIGO discovery and propose this, uh, I think it's a very cool idea of uh, uh, cosmic archaeology. Now looking into the future, uh, first uh, I will continue to uh, have direct impact input for the design and development of major upcoming experiments. And also have a, a line, a uh, series of ideas uh, to probe new aspects uh, of uh, uh, understanding and detecting dark matter, uh, new ideas on uh, matter-antimatter asymmetry and uh, uh, new probes as well as uh, uh, probing other gravity wave sources and uh, dig deeper into the potential of uh, what gravity waves uh, can tell us about new physics. So many of these uh, uh, ongoing or planned projects involve uh, uh, current or former uh, postdoc and students at UCR. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to wrap up my talk and thank you all for attending. Thanks, Tiano. Very nice. Uh, questions? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Uh, uh, may yeah. I have a question on your slides uh, about cosmic archaeology? Oh, um, let me see. Uh, several, uh, am I still sharing the screen? Sorry. Yes. It seems uh, yeah. in several slides you show a figure of uh, right. Uh, hold on. Let me find the which slide here. Ah, yes. This one. So, yeah, I have yes. uh, several different plots. Yeah, mm -hmm. this one. Uh -huh. So here, uh, do I understand correctly that uh, mm -hmm. the theoretical prediction black line corresponds right. to a family of theoretical prediction instead of a single one? Uh. No, the standard cosmology is actually uh, we we know the story. Uh, it's a definite story. So uh, I think I reviewed it here. Yeah. Uh, wait. Hold on. Yeah, this is a standard history where you have inflation and then you have the uh, radiation dominated era up to the uh, the familiar matter radiation uh, equality time. So what we did is that this. Standard cosmology history is a known thing. So we know the H as a function of T evolution. Then we plug this in to uh, find this spectrum. Uh, I see. So, yeah, so it's, there's a correspondence, one to one correspondence between the cosmic history and the spectrum you see. I see. I see. Yeah. Uh, so, so the origin of this uh, feature is because uh, those strings last for a long time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a key point. I, yeah, I emphasize that uh, different from many other sources, this uh, the string signal is emitted throughout the history, which enable us to populate this uh, wide frequency range. I see. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Bo. Did you have a question? Yeah, I will. Uh... So you know was mentioning about you know the astrophysical background. The you mentioned how to overcome. But if I'm interested in like astrophysical background, like a stochastic like a, a gravitational waves, even but how likely we could detect it? I mean, so uh, could you maybe elaborate on this a little bit more? That yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, uh, yeah. As I mentioned, uh, although the focus of my talk is on uh, high energy physics, beyond standard model high energy physics signal. But the, the stochastic background from astro sources are very interesting on their own, right? And uh, actually at LIGO, they uh, are having this uh, inclusive search, uh, which in, uh, is an inclusive search that includes uh, both astro and the, uh, the cosmological background. So then if you're interested in the astrophysical uh, source, there could be some finer feature that you can use. Like there could be a, a uh, a larger non-gaussianity in your signal, and people wrote paper on that. Yeah, so there's certainly a, a prospect of uh, uh, finding this uh, astrophysical source as well. 
But, but for that, maybe I can ask one more you know, related is that I would expect that there's a lot of sources, right? So there's all the signals will be stacked together. Is there any way like to distinguish? I mean, even including your new Felix source, right? So, I mean, you give an example looking to the frequency domain, um, but is this, uh, is there any other ways? I mean, I, because I, I don't have any idea about in this field, but uh, I'm very curious about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah very good question. So I think, um, of course, you can have this uh, super uh, position of different sources, which was what we did in our the likelihood analysis with Simeon Berry. Uh, so yeah, what you can do is that you can have coexistence of astro and the cosmological sources, uh, but uh, you can use this uh, likelihood template analysis uh, to be able to uh, find out uh, what's the weight of each component, right? Okay. Yeah, and I, so I, I think the, the the main thing is that I expect the first discovery would be uh, uh, excess in gravity uh, surface background, and then the question is: is it astral or cosmological? So that's the next level of question. Yeah, that's very true. good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Any other questions? I had a quick one, uh, Yanu. Uh, just mm -hmm. curious, the last item on your last slide about the uh, connection of the baryon asymmetry to large scale structure. Oh, yeah, that oh, is uh, uh, yeah, that is an uh, ongoing study. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that is an uh, ongoing study where uh, we're considering that uh, Although the, the high energy or the very high scale biogenesis, like the leptogenesis or uh, also gas biogenesis, uh, usually there's no way to directly probe them because it happens at very high energy early universe. But we are finding a possibility that uh, there's this recent proposal, so called cosmological collider physics, where you can look into the non Gaussianity in the primordial perturbation, uh, which can have information about this. Uh, the, the interaction between particles in the very early universe. So the, what we are looking at here is that there could be some high scale biogenesis models uh, where the interaction can be probed through this uh, non gaussianity signal from the large scale structure data. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Any final questions? Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, so, so I just wanted to know, like, how do like specifically primordial black holes would affect this, um, the background, uh, this GW spectrum? Uh, the primordial black hole, uh, this, uh, so first, whether there's primordial black hole is still uh, something that people are exploring. I think Simon probably know more about this. And if they do exist, uh, they would, uh, 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 they can also form a, a, a stochastic background uh, through the this uh, the, uh, the earlier events. Uh, but I would say this this would be a more uh, a, a, in terms of the, uh, the the cosmic string or phase transition uh, signal that I'm talking about here. The primordial bl black hole signal uh, would be a, a background of more uncertainty uh, compared to the, the astral sources that we consider in the paper with the Simeon Berry. But it, it's an interesting potential contribution. Uh, but the, for the analysis, the simplest thing to start with to uh, consider uh, some uh, 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 well-defined models and to see how much you can distinguish the two. So you could do the same exercise if you have a, a certain uh, model for primordial black hole. Oh, okay. I mean, I just wanted to make a comment there because mm -hmm. um, because with these cosmological, uh, with, uh, you know, with the periods of cosmological phase transition, mm -hmm. I mean, they also predict an increase in the formation of primordial black holes, like a era where you're producing a lot of primordial black holes. So every time a phase transition happens, so I'm just... Uh, it's, not all, it's not always uh, producing primordial black hole. It depends. It's, uh, yes, yeah, that's yeah, actually yes. also one thing that I'm looking at. Yeah, so th yeah, that's a possibility. Yes. Okay. But it's not always, uh, you do not always have primordial black hole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay.
No final questions? No more questions? Okay, I think we are done. So let's all thank Yandu again. Thanks. Yeah, thanks all for attending. Bye. Bye.